Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day, and I'm sitting here on my balcony about to do some reading about nothing more scintillating and fascinating of a topic than regression. Um, obviously, equations don't really lend themselves to being read aloud. They tend to make no sense and be confusing. So for those sections, I'd recommend obviously having a copy of your book open. Um, maybe people won't want to listen to these out loud at all because it's easier to read them. However, as I said, I'll be reading everything aloud. I do mean everything, and so I am not going to stop here. And certainly for the first half of uh, chapter two, um, it seems to be mostly text, just explaining how regressions work in general. Um, so for that section, that's fine, but for the second section, which, as I said, is quite heavy on uh, actual equations, um, with all kinds of algebra, um, that you will absolutely need to look at for yourself. Um, but I'm not your mum, and you're a grown-ass adult, and you've probably already read this, so don't worry about it. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to get started. So, chapter two, regression. As always, it starts with a little quote. Kwai Chang Kane, a walker is known by his tools. A shovel is for a man who digs. An axe is for a The econometrician runs regressions. It's a deep and meaningful quote from Kung Fu, season one, episode eight. Our path. When the path to random assignment is blocked, we look for alternate routes to causal knowledge. Wielded skillfully, metrics tools other than random assignment can have much of the causality revealing power of a real experiment. The most basic of these tools is regression, which compares treatment and control subjects who have the same observed characteristics. Regression concepts are foundational, paving the way for more elaborate tools used in the chapters that follow. Regression-based causal inference is predicated on the assumption that when key observation variables have been made across treatment and control groups, selection bias from the things we can't see is also mostly eliminated. We illustrate this idea with an empirical investigation of the economic returns to attendance at elite private colleges. Uh, 2.1, a tale of two colleges, which for those of you who aren't British is a uh, play on words, or play on phrases rather, of uh, Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, a very famous book that I haven't read because I hear it's dry and boring as fuck. But there you go, now you're slightly more cultured for the better. <laughs> anyway, students who attended a private four-year college in America paid an average of about 29,000 US dollars in tuition and fees in the 2012 to 2013 school year. Those who went to a public university in their home state paid less than 9,000. An elite private education might be better in many ways. The class is smaller, the athletic facilities newer, the faculty more distinguished, and the students smarter. But £20,000 per year of study is a big difference. It makes you wonder whether the difference is worth it. The uh, apples to apples question in this case asks how much a 40-year-old Massachusetts-born graduate of, say, Harvard would have earned if he or she had gone to the University of Massachusetts instead. Uh, money isn't everything, but as Groucho Marx observed, money frees you from doing the things you dislike. Since I dislike doing nearly everything, money is handy. So when we ask whether the private school... Incidentally, I think Groucho Marx was a US comedian, quite famous. I don't think I can replicate his accent, unfortunately, so that quote went in my regular accent. I also tend to go on little tiny tangents like this every now and then. If you don't like those, then I guess I'll try and adapt, but... I think it makes it slightly more enjoyable to listen to, in my opinion, so obviously I'm all open to feedback on that. Anyway, let's carry on, because there's lots to read. So when we ask whether private school tuition premium is worth paying, we focus on the possible earnings gained and enjoyed by those who attend elite private paying. Ah, uh, I completely messed that up. So when we ask whether it is worth paying, we focus on the possible earnings gain enjoyed by those who attend elite private universities. Higher earnings aren't the only reason you might prefer an elite private institution over your local state school. Many college students meet a future spouse and make lasting friendships while in college. 
Still, when families invest an additional $100,000 or more in human capital, a higher anticipated earnings payoff seems likely to be part of the story. Comparisons of earnings between those who attend different sorts of schools invariably reveal large gaps in favor of elite college alumni. Thinking this through, however, it's easy to see why comparisons of the earnings of students who attended Harvard and UMass, uh, which is a shortening for University of Massachusetts, are unlikely to reveal the payoff of a Harvard degree. This comparison reflects the fact that Harvard grads typically have better high school grades and higher SAT scores, uh, are more motivated, and perhaps have other skills and talents. No disrespect intended for the many good students who go to UMass, but it's damn hard to get into Harvard. And those who do are a special and select group. In contrast, UMass accepts and even awards scholarship money to almost every Massachusetts applicant with decent 10th grade test scores. We should therefore expect earnings comparisons across alma maters to be contaminated by selection bias, just like the comparisons of health by insurance status discussed in the previous chapter. We've also seen that this sort of selection bias is eliminated by random assignment. Regrettably, the Harvard Admissions Office is not yet prepared to turn their admissions decisions over to a random number generator. The question of whether college selectivity matters must be answered using the data generated by the routine application admission and matriculation decisions made by students and universities of various types. Can we use the, these data to mimic the randomized trial we'd like to run in this context? Not to perfection, surely, but we may be able to come close. The key to this undertaking is the fact that many decisions and choices, including those related to college attendance, involve a certain amount of serendipitous variation generated by financial considerations, personal circumstances, and timing. Serendipity can be exploited in a sample of applicants on the cusp who could easily go one way or the other. Does anyone admitted to Harvard really go to their local state school instead? Our former, uh, pardon our friend and former MIT PhD student, Nancy, did just that. Nancy grew up in Texas, so the University of Texas was her state school. UT's flagship Austin campus is rated highly competitive in Barron's rankings, but it's not Harvard. In the UK, you might say it's not, it's not Oxbridge, i.e. it's not Oxford or Cambridge. Um, I would imagine Harvard doesn't really have much by way of rivals in the US. Anyway, UT is, however, much... Uh, I must mention that on my balcony it is in fact the ground floor, so when loud and obnoxious kids uh, are playing in the fields opposite, you may be able to hear them, and for this I apologise, but I'm definitely not going to do the readings indoors because it's sunny. Anyway, let's carry on. UT is, however, much less expensive than Harvard. Uh, the Princeton Review recently named UT Austin as be a best value college. Admitted to both Harvard and UT, Nancy chose UT over Harvard because the UT admissions office, anxious to boost average SAT scores on campus, offered Nancy and a few other outstanding applicants an especially generous financial aid package, which Nancy gladly accepted. What are the consequences of Nancy's decision to accept UT's offer and decline Harvard's? Things worked out pretty well for Nancy, in spite of her choice of UT over Harvard. Today, she's an economics professor at another Ivy League school in New England. That's only one example. Well, actually, it's two. Our friend Mandy got her bachelor's from the University of Virginia, her home state school, declining offers from Duke, Harvard, Princeton, and Stanford. And today, Mandy teaches at Harvard. A sample of two is still too small for reliable causal inference. We'd like to compare many people like Mandy and Nancy to many other similar people who chose private colleges and universities. From larger group comparisons, we can hope to draw general lessons. Access to a large sample is not enough, however. The first and most important step in our effort to isolate the serendipitous component of school choice is to hold the constant the obvious and important differences between students who go to private and state schools. In this manner, we hope, though cannot promise, to make other things equal. Here, here's a small sample numerical example to illustrate the Cateris Paribus idea. We'll have more data when the time comes for real empirical work. Suppose the only things that matter in life, at least as far as your earnings go, are your SAT scores. Incidentally, SAT scores are the equivalent of, um, basically it's an exam you do at the age of either 16 or 18 or some such, and it's, some, it's, it's essentially purely for the purpose of entering a US university. Um, I obviously grew up in the UK, but a number of students at my school also took SAT to, uh, tests in order to then migrate to the US to study there instead. So basically, no matter what country you come from, if you want to go to a US university, you've got to do an SAT uh, test. 
Uh, I'm sure many of you already knew that, but just in case you didn't, that puts it into context and hopefully it makes a bit more sense. Anyway, um, the most important things are your ST scores and where you go to school. Consider Yuma and Harvey, both of whom have a combined reading and math score of 1400 on the SAT. Yuma went to UMass while Harvey went to Harvard. I see what they did there. We start by comparing Yuma and Harvey's earnings. Because we've assumed that all that matters for earnings besides college choice is the combined SAT score, Yuma versus Harvey is a Kateris Paribas comparison. In practice, of course, life is more complicated. This simple example suggests one significant complication. Yuma is a young woman, and Harvey is a young man. Women with similar educational qualifications often earn less than men because of the goddamn patriarchy. Doesn't actually say that in the book, I added that. Perhaps due to the discrimination or time spent out of the labor market to have children, which again is to, due to the goddamn patriarchy, because what progressive nations like Sweden and Norway, and possibly even Denmark, but I'm not sure about that, is that uh, when you have a child, both parents get equal maternity leave. Um, usually instead of nine months, it becomes six months each, for obviously a total of 12 months. But um, the families are A, free to divvy it up between either parents however they wish, and B, it's much more progressive because both parents at that critical period when the child has just been born are at home looking after it, which makes way more sense from a family upbringing sort of perspective. And of course, more sense from a uh, financial or rather professional perspective because it, me it means both parents individually spend much less time out of the market. Anyway, I digress. Let us return to the topic at hand. Um, the fact that Harvey earns 20% more than Yuma may be the effect of a superior Harvard education, but it may just as well reflect a male-female wage gap generated by other things, like what I just described. We'd like to disentangle the pure Harvard effect from these things. This is easy if the only other thing that matters is gender. Replace Harv Harvey with a female Harvard student, Hannah, who has a, also has a combined SAT of 1400, and could th compare Yuma and Hannah instead. Finally, because we're after general conclusions that go beyond individual stories, we look for many similar same-sex and same SAT contrasts across the two schools. That is, we compute the average earnings difference among Harvard and UMass students with the same gender and SAT score. The average of all such group-specific Harvard versus UMass differences is our, uh, S, uh, is our first shot at estimating the causal effect of a Harvard education. This is an econometric matching estimator that controls for, that is, holds fixed, sex and SAT scores. Assuming that, conditional on sex and SAT scores, the students who attend Harvard and UMass have similar earnings potential, this estimator captures the average causal effect of a Harvard degree on earnings. Matchmaker, matchmaker. Alas, there's more to earnings than sex, schools, and SAT scores. Um, since college attendance decisions aren't randomly assigned, we must control for all factors that determine both attendance decisions and later earnings. These factors include student characteristics like writing ability, diligence, family connections, and more. Control for such a wide range of factors seems daunting. The possibilities are virtually infinite, and many characteristics are hard to quantify. But Stacy Bergdale and Alan Kruger came up with a clever and compelling shortcut. Instead of identifying everything that might matter for college choice and earnings, they work with a key summary measure, the characteristics of college to which students applied and were admitted. Consider again the tale of Yuma and Harvey, both applied to and were admitted to UMass and Harvard. The fact that Yuma applied to Harvard suggests that she had the motivation to go there, while her admission to Harvard suggests that she had the ability to succeed there, just like Harvey. At least that's what the Harvard admissions office thinks, and they are not easily fooled. Yuma nevertheless opts for a cheaper UMass education. Her choice might be attributable to factors that are not closely related to Yuma's earnings potential, such as a successful uncle who went to UMass, a best friend who chose UMass, or the fact that Yuma missed the deadline for, an easily, for that easily won Rotary Club scholarship that would have funded an Ivy League education. If such serendipitous events were decisive for Yuma and Harvey, then the two of them make a good match. Dale and Kruger analyzed a large set called College and Beyond. The CNB data set contains information on thousands of students who enrolled in a group of moderately to highly selective US colleges and universities 
together with survey information collected from the students at the time they took the SAT. About a year before um, college entry, and information collected in 1996, long after most had graduated from college. The analysis here focuses on students who enrolled in 1976 and were working in 1995. Most adult college graduates are working. The colleges include prestigious private universities like the University of Pennsylvania, Princeton and Yale, a number of smaller private colleges like Swarthmore, Williams and Oberlin, and four public universities, Michigan, the University of North Carolina, Penn State, and Miami University in Ohio. The average 1978 SAT scores at these schools range from a low of 1,020 at Tulane to a high of 1,370 at Bryn Mawr. In 1976, tuition rates were as low as $540 at the University of North Carolina and as high as $3,850 at Tufts. Table 2.1 details a stripped-down version of the Dale and Kruger matching strategy in a setup we call the College Matching Matrix. This table lists applications, admissions, and matriculation decisions for a made-up list of nine students, each of whom applied to as many as three schools chosen from an imaginary list of six. Three out of the six schools listed in the table are public. All State, Tall State, and Altered State. That, that's pretty funny. Anyway. Ivy, Leafy, and Smart. Five of our uh, nine students, numbers one, two, four, six, and seven, attended private schools. Average earnings in this group are $92,000. The other four, with average earnings of $72,500, went to a public school. The almost $20,000 US dollar gap between these two groups suggests a large private school advantage. There's then the table, which obviously you probably want to look at. The students in table 2.1 are organized in four groups defined by the set of schools to which they were applied and were admitted. Within each group, students are likely to have similar career ambitions, whilst they were also judged to be of similar ability by the admission staff at the schools to which they applied. Within groups, comparisons should therefore be considerably more apples to apples than uncontrolled comparisons involving all students. The three Group A students applied to two private schools, Leafy and Smart, and one public school. Um, oops, I've lost where I was going. And one public school, Tall State. Although these students were rejected at Leafy, they were admitted to Smart and Tall State. Students 1 and 2 went to Smart, while student 3 opted for Tall State. The students in Group A have high earnings and probably come from upper middle class families. A signal here is that they apply to more private schools than public. Student 3, though admitted to SMART, opted for cheaper tall state, perhaps to save her family money, like our friends Nancy and Mandy. Although the students in Group A have done well uh, with high average earnings and a high rate of, of uh, private school attendance within Group A, the private school differential is negative. Um, in other words, a gap of minus $5,000. The comparison in Group A is one of a number of possible match comparisons in the table. Group B includes two students, each of whom applied to one private and two public schools, IV, All State, and Altered State. The students in Group B have lower average earnings than those in Group A. Both were admitted to all three schools to which they applied. Number four enrolled at IV, while number five chose Altered State. The earnings differential here is $30,000. This gap suggests a substantial private school advantage. Group C includes two students who applied to a single school, Leafy, where they were admitted and enrolled. Group C earnings reveal nothing about the effects of private school attendance because both students in the group attended private school. The two students in Group D applied to three schools, were admitted to two, and made different choices. But these two students chose Allstate and Tallstate, both public schools, so their earnings also revealed nothing about the value of a private education. Group C and D are uninformative because, from the perspective of our effort to estimate a private school treatment effect, each is composed of, of either all treated or all controlled individuals. Groups A and B are where the action is in our example, since these groups include public and private school students who applied to and were admitted to the same set of schools. To generate a single estimate that uses all available data, we average the group-specific estimates. 
The average of minus $5,000 for group A and $30,000 for group B is $12,500. This is a good estimate of the effect of private school attendance on earnings, uh, pardon, on average earnings, because to a large degree it controls for the applicant's choices and abilities. The simple average of treatment control differences in group A and B isn't the only re uh, well-controlled comparison that can be computed from these two groups. For example, we might construct a weighted average which reveals the fact that group B includes two students and group A includes three. The weighted average in this case is calculated by emphasizing larger groups. This weighting scheme uses the data more efficiently and will generate a statistically more precise summary of the pi private public earnings differential. The most important point in this context is the apples to apples and oranges to oranges nature of the underlying matched comparisons. Apples in group A are compared to other group A apples, while oranges in group B are compared only with oranges. In contrast, naive comparisons that simply compare the earnings of private and public school students generate a much larger gap of 19,500 when computed using all nine students in the table. Even when I limited to the pardon, even when limited to five students in group A and B, the uncontrolled comparison generates a gap of $20,000. These much larger uncontrolled comparisons reflect selection bias. Students who apply to and admitted to private schools have higher earnings wherever they ultimately choose to go. Evidence of selection bias emerges from a comparison of average earnings across, instead of within, groups A and B. Average earnings in group A, where two-thirds apply to private schools, are around $107,000. Average earnings in group B, where two-thirds apply to public schools, are only $45,000. Our within-group comparisons reveal that much of this shortfall is unrelated to students' college attendance decisions. Rather, the cross-group differential is explained by a combination of ambition and ability, as reflected in application decisions and the set of schools to which students were admitted. <clears throat> Make me a match, run me a regression. Regression is the tool that masters pick up first, if only to provide a benchmark for more elaborate empirical strategies. Although regression is a many-splendid thing, we think of it as an automatic matchmaker. Specifically, the regression estimates are weighted averages of multiple matched comparisons of the sort of constructed uh, for the groups in our stylized matching matrix. The appendix to this chapter discusses a closely related connection between regression and mathematical expectation. The key ingredients in the recipe are the dependent variable, in this case student i's earnings later in life, also called the outcome variable, denoted in yi. The treatment variable, in this case uh, a dummy variable that indicates students who attended a private college or university, uh, denoted by pi, and a set of control variables, in this case variables that identify sets of schools to which a student applied and were admitted. In our matching matrix, the five uh, students in groups A and B contribute useful data whilst the students in groups C and D can be discarded. In a data set containing those left after discarding groups C and D, a single variable indicating the students in group A tells us which of the two groups uh, the remaining students are in because those not in group A are in group B. This variable, which we'll call AI, is our sole control. Note that both PI and AI are dummy variables. That is, they equal 1 to indicate observations in a specific state or condition, and 0 otherwise. Dummies, as they are called, no reference to ability here, classify data into simple yes or no categories. Even so, by coding many dummies, we get a set of control variables that's as detailed as we like. The regression model in this context is an equation linking the treatment variable to the dependent variable while holding control variables fixed by including them in the model. With only one controlled variable, the regression of interest, uh, pardon, with only one control variable called AI, the regression of interest can be written as yi equals alpha plus beta pi plus gamma ai plus epsilon i. 
The distinction between the treatment variable PI and the control variable AI in equation 2.1 is conceptual, not formal. There is nothing in equation 2.1 to indicate which is which. Your research question and empirical strategy justify the choice of variables and determine the roles they play. As in the previous chapter, here we also use Greek letters for parameters to distinguish them from the variables in the model. The regression parameters, called regression coefficients, are the intercept, alpha, the causal effect of treatment, beta, and the effect of being a group A student, gamma. The last component of equation 2.1 is the residual, uh, EI, also called an error term. Residuals are defined as the difference between the observed YI and the fitted values generated by the specific regression model we have in mind. These fitted values are written as, uh, you better look at it, but it's uh, Y with a hat I, alpha plus beta PI plus gamma AI. And the corresponding residuals are given by epsilon I equals YI plus minus uh, Y with a hat I, which equals YI minus in brackets alpha plus beta PI plus gamma alpha I, uh, close brackets, pardon, gamma AI. Look, this is why you can't read equations out loud. It, it just becomes a mess and it doesn't make sense anyway. So look at the goddamn page. Regression analysis al assigns values to model parameters alpha, beta, and gamma so as to make them uh, Y with a hat I as close to possible to Y I. This is accomplished by choosing values that minimize the sum of squared residuals leading to the moniker ordinary least squares for the resulting estimates. Executing this minimization in a particular sample, we are said to be estimating regression parameters. Metrics masters, who estimate regression models every day, are sometimes said to run regressions, though it often seems that regressions run us rather than the other way around. The formalities of regression, estimation, and the statistical theory uh, that goes with it are sketched in the appendix of this chapter. Running regression, Brackets 2.1 on data for the five students in groups A and B generates the following estimates, uh, saying that these estimates can be computed using a hand calculator, but for real empirical work, we use professional regression software. Alpha equals 40,000, beta equals 10,000, and gamma equals 60,000. The private school coefficient in this case is 10,000, implying a private public earnings differential of $10,000. This is indeed a weighted average of our two group-specific effects. Um, recall that group A's effect is minus 5,000 and group B's effect is 30,000. While this is neither the simple unweighted average of 12,500 nor the group-sized weighted average of 9,000, it's not too far from either of them. In this case, regression assigns a weight of 4 out of 7 to group A and 3 out of 7 to group B. As with these other averages, the regression-weighted average is considerably smaller than the uncontrolled earnings gap between private and public school alumni. Regression estimates and the associated standard errors used to quantify their sampling variance are readily constructed using computers and econometric software. Computational simplicity and the conceptual interpretation of regression estimates as a weighted average of group-specific differences are two of the reasons we regress. Regression also has two more things going for it. First, it's a convention among masters to report regression estimates in almost every econometric investigation of causal effects, including those involving treatment variables that take on more than two values. Regression estimates provide a simple benchmark for fancier techniques. Second, under some circumstances, regression estimates are efficient in the sense of providing the most statistically precise estimates of average causal effects that we can hope to obtain from a given sample. This technical point is reviewed briefly in the chapter appendix. Public-private face-off. The CNB dataset includes more than 14,000 former students. These students were admitted and rejected at many different combinations of schools. CNB asked for the names of at least three schools students considered seriously, besides the one attended. Many of the possible application acceptance sets in this data are represented by only a single student. Moreover, in some sets with more than one student, all schools are either public or private. Just as with group C and D in table 2.1, these perfectly homogeneous groups provide no guidance as to the value of a private education. 
We can increase the number of useful comparisons by deeming schools to be matched if they are equally selective instead of insisting on identical matches. To fatten up the groups in, uh, that this scheme produces, we'll call, the, we'll call the schools comparable if they fall into the same barren selectivity categories. Returning to our stylized matching matrix, suppose all state and tall state are read as competitive. Pardon, rated as competitive, and altered state and smart are rated as highly competitive, and ivy and leafy are the most competitive. In the barren scheme, those who applied to tall state, smart, and leafy, and were admitted into tall state and smart, can be compared with students who applied to all state, smart, and ivy, and were admitted to all state and smart. Students in both groups applied to one competitive, one highly competitive, and one most competitive school, and they were admitted to one competitive and one highly competitive school. In the C and B data, 9,202 students can be matched in this way, but because we're interested in public-private comparisons, our Barron's match sample is also limited to match applicant groups that contain both public and private school students. This leaves 5,583 match students for analysis. These match students fall into 151 similar selectivity groups containing both public and private students. Our operational, uh, pardon, our operational regression model for the barren selectivity matched sample differs from regression 2.1, used to analyze the matching matrix in table 2.1 in a number of ways. First, the operational model puts the natural log of earnings on the left-hand side instead of earnings itself. As explained in the chapter appendix, the use of a log-dependent variable allows regression estimates to be interpreted as a percent change. For example, an estimated beta of 0.5 um, implies that private school alumni earn about, pardon, of 0 0.05 implies that private school alumni earn about 5% more than public school alumni. Pardon, oh, I'm going to start the whole sentence again. For example, an estimated beta of 0 0.05 implies that private school alumni earn about 5% more than public school alumni, conditional on whatever controls were included in the model. Another important difference between our operational uh, empirical model and Table 2.1 uh, example is that the former includes many control variables, while the example controls only for the dummy variable AI, including uh, pardon, indicating students in Group A. The key controls in the operational model are a set of many dummy variables indicating all Barron's matches represented in the sample, with one group left out as a reference category. These controls capture the relative selectivity of the schools to which students applied and were admitted in the real world, where many combinations of schools are possible. The resulting regression model looks some horrible equation that I'm not going to read out. The parameter beta in this model is still the treatment effect of interest, uh, an estimate of the causal effect of attendance at a private school, but this model controls for 151 groups instead of the two groups in our example. The parameters uh, y, pardon, gamma j, for j equals 1 to 150, are the coefficients on 150 selectivity group dummies, denoted group ji. It's worth unpacking the notation in equation 2.2 since we'll use it again. The dummy variable group ji equals 1 when the student i is in group j and is 0 otherwise. For example, the first of these dummies, denoted group 1, might indicate students who applied and were admitted to three highly competitive schools. The second, group 2i, might indicate students who applied to two highly competitive schools and one most competitive school, and were admitted to one of each type. The order in which the categories are coded doesn't matter as long as we code dummies for all possible combinations, with one group admitted as a reference group. Although we've gone from one group dummy to 150, the idea is as before. Controlling for the sets of schools to which students applied and were admitted brings us one giant step closer to a Cateris Paribas comparison between private and public school students. A final modification for operational purposes is the addition of two further control variables, individual SAT scores and the log of parental income, plus a few variables we'll relegate to a footnote. The individual SAT and log parental income scores appear in the model with coefficients delta i and delta, pardon, delta 1 and delta 2, uh, read as delta 1 and delta 2, uh, which, I, which I did read as because I had a private school education, respectively. Uh, controls uh, for a direct measure of individual aptitude, like students' SAT scores, and a measure of family background, like parental income, may help the public-private comparisons at the heart of our model uh, more apples to apples and oranges to oranges than they otherwise would be. 
At the same time, conditional on selectivity group dummies, such controls may no longer matter, a point explained in the detail below. Regressions run. We start with regression estimates of the private school's earnings advantage from the models with no controls. The coefficient from a regression of log earnings in 1995 on a dummy from private school attendance with no other regressors, that is to say right-hand side variables, in the model gives the raw difference in log earnings between those who attended a private school and everyone else. The chapter's app appendix explains why regression on a single dummy variable uh, produces a difference in means across groups de part of defined by the dummy. Not surprisingly, this raw gap reported in the first column of Table 2.2, which is on the following page if you're reading in the book, shows a substantial private school premium. Uh, specifically, private school studies are estimated to have earnings about 14% higher than the earnings of other students. The numbers that appear in the parentheses below the regression estimates in Table 2.2 are the estimated standard errors that go with these estimates, like the standard errors for a difference in means discussed in the appendix to Chapter 1. These standard errors quantify the statistical precision of reg the regression estimates reported here. The standard error associated with the estimate in column 1 is 0 0.055. The fact that 0.135 is more than twice the size of the associated standard error of 0.055 makes it very unlikely the positive estimated private school gap is merely a chance finding. The private school coefficient is statistically significant. Uh, then we have the table. The large private school premium reported in column 1 of table 2.2 is an interesting descriptive fact, but as our example calculation, some of this gap is almost certainly due to selection bias. As we show below, private school students have higher SAT scores and come from wealthier families than do public school students, and so might be expected to earn more regardless of where they went to college. Uh, we therefore control for measures of ability and family background when estimating the private school premium. An estimate of the private school premium from a regression model that includes an individual SAT control is reported in column 2 of table 2.2. Every 100 points of SAT achievement are associated with about a 5% points earnings gain. Controlling for students' SAT scores reduces the measured private school premium to about 0.1. Adding controls for parental income as well as for demographic characteristics related to race and sex, high school rank, and whether the graduate was a college athlete brings the private school premium down a little further, to a still substantial and statistically significant 0.086, reported in column 3 of the table. A substantial effect indeed, but probably still too big, that is, contaminated by positive selection bias. Uh, column 4 reports estimates from a model with no controls for ability, family background, or demographic characteristics. Importantly, however, the regression model uh, used to construct the estimate reported in this column includes a dummy for each match college university, uh, pardon, for each match college selectivity group in the sample. That is, the model you construct this estimate includes dummy variables group JI for J equals 1 uh, to 150, and it says in brackets that the table admits the many estimated yj this model produces, pardon, gamma j that this model produces, but indicates their inclusion in the row labeled section controls. The estimated, the estimated private school premium with selectivity group controls included is almost bang on zero with a standard error of about 0.04. And that's not all. Having killed the private school premium with selectivity group dummies, columns 5 and 6 show that the premium moves little when controls for ability and family background are added to the model. This suggests that control for college application and admissions um, selectivity groups takes us a long way towards the apples to apples and oranges to oranges comparisons at the heart of any credible regression strategy for causal inference. The results in columns 4 to 6 of table 2.2 are generated by the subsample of 5,583 students for whom we can construct Barron's matches and generate within group comparisons of public and private school students. Perhaps there's something special about this limited sample which contains less than half of the full complement of C and B respondents. This concern motivates a less demanding control scheme that includes only the average SAT score in the set of school students applied to plus dummies for the number of schools applied to. That is, a dummy for students who applied to only two schools, a dummy for students who applied to three schools, and so on, instead of a full set of 150 selectivity group dummies. 
This regression, which can be estimated in the full CMB sample, is christened the self-revelation model because it's motivated by the notion that applicants have a pretty good idea of their ability and where they're likely to be admitted. This self-assessment is reflected uh, in the number and average selectivity of the schools to which they apply. As a rule, weaker applicants uh, apply to fewer and to less selective schools than do stronger applicants. The, revel the self-revelation model generates results remarkably similar to those generated by Barron's matches. The self-revelation estimates, computed in a sample of 14,238 students, can be seen in Table 2.3. As before, the first three tables show that the raw private school premium falls markedly, but remains substantial when controls for ability and family background are added to the model, falling in this case from 0.21 to 0.14. At the same time, columns 4 to 6 uh, show that models controlling for the number and average selectivity of the group students apply to generate small and statistically insignificant effects on the order of 0.03. Moreover, as with the models that control for Barron's matches, models with average selectivity controls generate estimates that are largely insensitive to the inclusion of controls for ability and family background. Private university attendance seems unrelated to future earnings once we control for selection bias, but perhaps our focus on public-private comparisons misses the point. Students may benefit from attending schools like Ivy, Leafy or Smart, simply because their classmates at such schools are so much better. The synergy generated by a strong peer group may be the feature that justifies the private school price tag. We can explore this hypothesis by replacing the private school dummy in the self-revelation model with a measure of peer quality. Specifically, as the original Dale and Kruger study that uh, inspires our analysis, replace PI in equation 2.2 with the average SAT scores of classmates at the school attended. Columns 1 to 3 of table 2.4 show that students who attended more selective schools do markedly better in the labour market with an estimated college selectivity effect on the order of 8% higher earnings for every 100 points of average selectivity increase. Yet this effect too appears to be an artefact of selection bias due to the greater ambition and ability of those who attend selective schools. Estimates from models with self-revelation controls reported in columns 4 to 6 of the table show average college selectivity to be essentially unrelated to earnings. <coughs> There's then um, a couple of tables, obviously. Uh, bear with me as the program is just blacked out for some reason. It does that sometimes. Okay. Um, finally, section 2.3, Cateris Paribus. Question mark. Topic. Briefly describe experiences, challenges, and accomplishments that define you as a person. Essay. I am a dynamic figure, often scaling walls and crushing ice. I cook 30-minute brownies in 20 minutes. I am an expert in stucco, I don't know what that is, a veteran in love, and an outlaw in Peru. On Wednesdays after school, I repair electrical appliances free of charge. I am an abstract artist, a concrete analyst, and a ruthless bookie. I wave, dodge, and frolic, yet my bills are all paid. I have won bullfights in San Juan, uh, cliff diving competitions in Sri Lanka, and spelling bees at the Kremlin. I have played Hamlet, I have performed open heart surgery, I have spoken with Elvis. But I have not yet gone to college. From an essay uh, by Hugh Gallagher, age 19. Hugh later went to New York University. Imagine if Harvey and Uma on the day admissions letters goes out. Uh, I somehow completely messed up that sentence, even though it's really simple. Let me try that once more. <clears throat> Imagine Harvey and Uma on the day admission letters go out. Both are delighted to get into Harvard. It must be those 20 minute brownies which frankly are just going to taste undercooked. Harvey immediately accepts Harvard's offer, wouldn't you? But Yuma makes a difficult choice and goes to UMass instead. What's up with Yuma? Is her Cateris really a Paribus? Um, is her everything really held constant? 
What the shit are you on about, economists? Anyway, UMA might have good reasons to opt for less prestigious UMass over Harvard. Pre uh, price is an obvious consideration, uh, as UMA want a Massachusetts Adams scholarship which pays state school tuition for good students like her, but cannot be used at private schools. If price matters more to UMA than to Harvey, it's possible that UMA's circumstances differ from Harvey's in other ways. Perhaps she's poorer. Some of our regression models control for parental income, but this is an imperfect measure of family living standards. Among other things, we don't know how many brothers and sisters the students in the CMB uh, sample had. A larger family at the same income level may find it harder to pay for each child's education. If family size is also related to later earnings, see chapter 3 for more on this point, our regression estimates of private college premia may not be apples to apples after all. <clears throat> this is more than a campfire story. Regression is a way to make other things equal, but equality is generated only for variables included as controls on the right-hand side of the model. Failure to include enough controls or the right control still leaves us with the selection bias. The regression version of the selection bias generated by inadequate controls is called omitted variables bias, and it's one of the most important ideas in the metrics canon. To illustrate OVB, we return to our five student example and the bias from omitting control for membership in applicant group A. The long regression here includes that dummy variable AI, which indicates those in group A. We write the regression model that includes AI as YI equals alpha to the 1 plus beta to the 1 PI plus gamma to the AI, pardon, plus gamma AI, flat, uh, plus ELI. Again, reading equations is a bitch, and I'm still not quite sure if I should be doing it at all. This is equation 2.1, rewritten uh, with superscript L on parameters, and the residual to remind us that the intercept and private school coefficient are from the long model, and to facilitate comparisons with the short model to come. Does the inclusion of A uh, matter for estimates of private school effect in the regression above? Uh, so Bloody insects. Does the inclusion of A, I, matter for the estimates of the private school effects in the regression above? Uh, suppose we make do with a short regression with no controls. This could be written as an equation. I think I'll just try and edit the YouTube video so the equations show up on the screen. That might take quite a bit of time, but I mean, we'll see. I'll, I'll try. Because the single regressor here is a dummy variable, the slope coefficient in this model is the difference in average YI between those with PI switched on and those with PI switched off. As we noted in selection 2.1, uh, beta to the S <coughs> uh, equals 20,000 in the short regression, while the long regression parameter beta I um, is only 10,000. The difference between beta S and beta L is the OVB due to emission of AI in the short regression. That is to say, the difference between uh, beta S, which is, you know, these equations really confuse me. I'm not very strong at this. I guess I'm going to have to run it through with somebody else who actually does understand these. I mean, I did economics, but it was never my strength. Anyway, so the difference between those two uh, variables is the omitted variable bias. Uh, that is to say, uh, because uh, AI is omitted in the short regression, uh, the two aren't the same number. Uh, so here, uh, OVB amounts to $10,000, a figure that is worth worrying about. No shit. Why does the omission of the Group A dummy change the private college effect so much? Recall that the average earnings of students in Group A exceeds the average earnings of those in Group B. Moreover, two-thirds of the students in high-earning Group A attended a private school, while lower-earning Group B is only half private. Differences in earnings between private and public alumni come in part from the fact that the mostly private uh, students in Group A have higher earnings anyway, regardless of where they enrolled. Inclusion of the Group A dummy in the long regression controls for this difference. As this discussion suggests, the formal connection between short and long regression coefficients has two components. I, 
the relationship between the omitted variable ai and the treatment variable pi, uh, we'll soon see how to quantify this with an additional regression. And ii, uh, the relationship, I should really read those as 1 and 2, I don't know why I did that. Anyway, the relationship between the omitted variable ai and the outcome variable yi. <clears throat> this is given by the coefficient on the omitted variable in the long regression, in this case the parameter gamma in the equation 2.3. Together, these pieces produce the omitted variable bias formula. We start with the fact that um, effect of pi in short equals effect of pi in long, plus the uh, relationship between omitted and included, times the effect of omitted in long. To be specific, when the omitted variable is ai and the treatment variable is pi, we have effect of pi in the short equals effect of pi in the long plus the relationship between AI and PI times the effect of AI in the long. Omitted variable bias, defined as the difference between the coefficient on PI and the short and long models, is a simple rearrangement of this equation. OVB equals relationship between AI and PI times effect of AI in long. We can refine the OVB formula using the fact that both terms in the formula are themselves regression coefficients. The first term is the coefficient from a regression of the omitted variable ai on the private school dummy. In other words, this term is the coefficient pi i, read, uh, pardon, pi 1, uh, in the regression model, ai equals pi 0 plus pi 1 p1 plus ui, where ui is a residual. We can now write the OVB formula compactly in Greek. OVB equals effect of PI in short minus effect of PI in long equals beta uh, G minus beta L equals uh, pi 1 times gamma. Where gamma is the coefficient on A1 in the long regression. This important formula is derived in the chapter appendix. Among students who attended private school, two are in group A and one in group B, while among those who went to public school, one is in group A and one is in group B. The coefficient pi i in our five student example is therefore two thirds minus a half, which equals 0.1667 to four decimal places. As noted in section 2.2, the coefficient y is 60,000, reflecting the higher earnings of group A. Putting the pieces together, we have OVB equals short minus long equals beta G minus beta L equals 20,000 minus 10,000, which equals 10,000. And OVB, uh, regression of omitted on included, times uh, effect of omitted in long equals um, pi 1 times gamma, which equals 0.1667 times 60,000, which equals 10,000. Uh, phew, the calculation suggested by the OVB formula indeed matches the direct comparison of short and long regression coefficients. The OVB formula is a mathematical result that explains differences between regression coefficients in any short versus long scenario, irrespective of the causal interpretation of the regression parameters. The labels short and long are purely relative. The short regression need not be particularly short, but the long regression is always longer, since it includes the same regressors, put at least one more, plus at least one more. The, often, the additional variables that make the long regression long are hypothetical, that is, unavailable in our data. The OVB formula is a tool that allows us to consider the impact of control for variables we wish we had. This, in turn, helps us to access whether Kateris is indeed Paribus. Uh, or in other words, whether all is indeed held constant. Which brings us back um, to Uma and Harvey. Suppose an omitted variable in equation 2.2 is family size, um, FSI. We've included parental income as a control variable, but the number of brothers and sisters who go to college, which is not available in the CNB dataset, when the omitted variable is FSI, we have OVB equals short minus long equals relationship between FSI and PI times effect of FSI in long. Uh, just a second. Okay, so there's just a few more pages.
Bear with me. Ugh. Why might the omission of family-sized bias regression estimates of the private college effect? Because differences in earnings between Harvard and UMass graduates arise in part from differences in family size between the two groups of students. This is the relationship between FSI and PI, and from the fact that smaller variables are associated with higher earnings, even after controlling for the variables included on in the short regression. This is the effect of FSI in the long regression, which includes these same controls as well. The long regression controls for the fact that uh, students who go to Harvard come from smaller families, on average, than do who went to UMass, while the short regression that omits FSI does not. The first term in the application of the OVB formula is the coefficient in a regression of omitted FSI on included PI variables and everything else that appears to be on the right-hand side of equation 2.2. This regression, which is sometimes said to be auxiliary because it helps us to interpret the regression we care about, can be written as another big equation that I'm not going to read out loud, called equation 2.4. Most of the coefficients in this equation are of little interest. What matters here is pi 1, since this captures the relationship between the omitted variable fsi and the variable whose effect we're after, pi, after controlling for other variables that appear both in the short and long regression models. To complete the OVB formula for this case, we write the long regression as, good heavens, equation 2.5, again using superscript L for long. The regressor FSI appears here with coefficient lambda. The OVB formula is therefore OVB equals short minus long equals beta minus beta L equals pi 1 times lambda, where beta is from equation 2.2. Continuing to think of equation 2.2 as the short regression, while the long regression includes the control variables that appear in this model plus family size, we see that OVB here is probably positive. Private schools tend to come from smaller families on average, even after conditioning on family income. If so, the regression coefficient linking family size and private college attendance is negative. Uh, in other words, pi 1 is less than 0 in equation 2.4. Students, uh, students from smaller families are also likely to earn more no matter what, where they go to school. So the effect of omitting family size controls in a long regression is also negative. Um, lambda mine, uh, is less. <coughs> lambda is less than zero in equation two point five. The product of these two negative terms is positive. Careful reasoning about OVB is an essential part of the metrics game. We can't use data to check the consequences of omitting variables that we don't observe, but we can use the OVB formula to make an educated guess as to the likely consequences of their omission. Most of the control variables that might be omitted from occasion 2.2 are similar to family size in that the sign of the OVB from their omission is probably positive. From this, we conclude that as small as the estimates of the effects of private schools attendance in columns 4 to 6 of table 2.2 to 2.3 are, they could well be too big. These estimates therefore weigh strongly against the hypothesis of a substantial private school earnings advantage. Regression Sensitivity Analysis Because we can never be sure whether a given set of controls is enough to eliminate selection bias, it's important to ask how sensitive regression results are to changes in the list of controls. Our confidence in regression estimates of causal effects grows when treatment effects are insensitive, masters say robust, to whether a particular variable is added or dropped as long as a few core controls are always included in the model. This desirable pattern is illustrated by columns 4 to 6 in tables 2.2 to 2.3, which show that estimates of the private school premium are insensitive inclusion of students' ability, as measured by own SAT scores, uh, parental income, and a few other control uh, variables once we control for the nature of the schools to which students applied. The OVB formula explains this remarkable finding. Start with table 2.5, which reports coefficients from regressions like table pardon, equation 2.4 except that instead of FSI, we put SATI on the left-hand side to produce the estimates in columns 1 to 3, whilst in LUNPII on the left-hand side generates columns 4 to 6. These auxiliary regressions assess the relationship between private school attendance and our two of our controls, SATI and LUNPI, conditional on other controls in the model. 
not surprisingly, private school attendance is a strong predictor of students' own SOG scores and family income relationships documented in columns 1 and 4 in the table. The addition of demographic controls, high school rank, and a dummy uh, for athletic participation does little to change this, as can be seen in columns 2 and 5. The control for the number of uh, applications and the average SAT scores of schools applied to, as in the self-revelation model, effectively eliminates the relationship between private school attendance and these important background variables. This explains why the estimated private school coefficients in columns 4, 5, and 6 of table 2.3 are essentially the same. The OVB formula is the prime directive of applied econometrics, so let's not rock it, pardon, let's rock it with our numbers and see how it works out. For illustration, we'll take the short model to be a regression of log wages on PI with no controls on the, and the long model to be a regression that adds individual SAT scores. The short no controls coefficient on PI in column 1 of table 2.3 is 0.212, while the corresponding long coefficient controlling for SATI in column 2 is 1.52, sorry, 0.152. As can also be seen in column 2 of the table, the effect of SATI in the long regression is 0.051. The first column in table 2.5 shows the regression of omitted SATI on included PI, produces a coefficient of 1.165. Putting these together, we have OVB two ways. OVB equals short minus long equals 0.212 minus 0.152, which equals 0.06. Or OVB equals regression of omitted on included times effect of omitted in long equals 1.165 uh, times 0.051, which equals 0.06. Compare this with the parallel calculation taking us from column 4 to column 5 in table 2.3. These columns report results from the models that include self-revelation controls. Here, short minus long is small. 0.034 minus 0.031 equals 0.003, to be precise. Both the short and long regressions include selectivity controls from the self-revelation model, as does the relevant auxiliary regression of our own laws on P1. With self-revelation controls include, uh, included in both models, we have OVB equals regression of omitted or included times effect of omitted in long equals 0.066 times 0.036 equals 0.0024. Rounding error with small numbers pushes off the target of 0.003. The effect of the omitted SAT1 in I in the long uh, regression falls here from 0.051 to 0.036, while the regression of omitted variables on uh, included goes from a hefty 1.165 to something an order of magnitude smaller as at 0 .00, pardon, 0 0.066, shown in column 3 of table 2.5. This shows that conditional on the number of uh, average selectivity of schools applied to, students who chose private and public schools aren't very different, at least as far as their own SAT scores go. Consequently, the gap between short and long estimates disappears. Because our estimated private school effect is insensitive to the inclusion of the available ability and family background variables once self revelations controls are included, other control variables, including those for which we have no data, might matter little as well. In other words, any remaining OVB due to uncontrolled differences is probably modest. This circumstantial evidence for modest OVB doesn't guarantee that the regression results discussed in this chapter have the same causal force as results from a randomized trial. We'd still rather have a real experiment. At a minimum, however, these findings call into question claims for a substantial earnings advantage due to the attendance pardon, due to attendance at expensive private colleges. <clears throat> Master, I believe this is the end of the chapter, though there is a little extra section just after this that I will read before the appendix, because it's like two pages long. Um, and again, there's a, a quote from this kung fu movie or television series or whatever that the authors seem to love so much. Uh, so I'm going to read that as well in my appalling Chinese accent, but really it's not that appalling because I'm half Chinese. Master Stemifu, in a nutshell, please, grasshopper. Grasshopper. Causal comparisons compare like with like. In assessing the effects of college choice, we focus on students with similar characteristics. Each is different in a thousand ways. Must always be similar? 
Good comparisons eliminate systematic differences between those who choose one path and those who choose another, when such differences are associated with outcomes. How is this accomplished? The method of matching sorts individuals into groups with the same value of control variables, like measures of ability and family background. Match comparisons within these groups are then averaged to get a single over or effect. And regression? Regression is an automated matchmaker. The regression estimate of a causal effect is also an average of within group comparisons. What is the tau of OVB? OVB is the difference between short and long regression coefficients. The long regression includes additional controls, those emitted from the short. Short equals long plus the effect of omitted in the long times the regression of omitted on included. Nothing omitted here, grasshopper. Look, I did my best, okay, I'm busting up my uh, vocal cords just for you. And finally, the last little section, Masters of Metrics, Galton and Yule. The term regression was coined by Sir Francis Galton, Charles Darwin's half-cousin, in 1886. Ah, that explains their choice of a uh, title earlier in this chapter. Anyway, Galton had many interests, but he was gripped by Darwin's masterpiece, The Origin of Species. Wait, no, I just confused Charles Dickens with Charles Darwin's. I am a Charles idiot. Um, but whatever. Fucking, it's still, it's still all correct and you're still stuff about history here, so hear me out, fam. Galton hoped to apply Darwin's theory of evolution to variations in human traits. In the cause of his research, Galton studied attributes ranging from fingerprints to beauty. He was also one of the many British intellectuals to use Darwin in the sinister service of eugenics. This regrettable diversion notwithstanding, his work in theoretical statistics had a lasting and salutary effect on social science. Galton laid the statistical foundations for quantitative social science of the sort that grips us. There's a little picture of him here. He was a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, of which I am a member. Uh, he was also the author of The Art of Travel, and of course he was knighted. He is Sir Francis Galton to you you lonely commoner. Galton also discovered that the average heights of fathers and sons are linked by a regression equation. He also uncovered an interesting implication of this particular regression model. The average height of sons is a weighted average of their father's height and the average height in the population from which the fathers and sons were sampled. Thus, parents who are taller than average will have children who are not quite as tall, while parents who are shorter than average will have children who are a bit taller. To be specific, Master Stevefu, who is six foot three, uh, can expect his children to be tall, though not as tall as he is. Thankfully, however, Master Joshua, who is uh, five foot six on a good day, can expect his children to attain a somewhat grander stature. In my personal case, I'm kind of tall. Uh, I'm actually taller than both my parents, but it's because m both my grandfathers were very tall, uh, both for their for both their respective um, genomes, is it called, or genetic structure, or whatever, genetic makeup, background. Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side, who is uh, from Alsace in France, so he's essentially almost German, um, he was tall even for a German, um, and my grandfather on my father's side, who obviously is Chinese, who unfortunately I never had the, uh, the privilege to meet, uh, before he passed away, um, he, I have seen photos of him, and he was truly exceptionally tall um, for a Chinese. Or, well, actually, for an average Chinese. For the South Chinese, they tend to be fairly tall anyway. But, um, again, for that reason, genetics goes upwards. Why am I digressing so much? There is a reason. I am actually very interested in biology and the like. This isn't really a talk show, but I'm going to share a little bit uh, about myself with you, purely because you've listened all the way to the end, and um, I also enjoy... Um, this subject in general. I like talking about it. It's interesting to me. You just didn't know what that was. That's essentially, um, ooh, how do I even put it nicely? It's not nice as a subject. It's uh, essentially breeding humans. Well, not necessarily breeding them, but um, at least encouraging socially or culturally um, some kind of uh, selective breeding, honestly. Um, it's not necessarily as sinister as the authors are trying to make it out to be, 
and certainly there have been much more sinister movements in the past, but it also includes things as simple as like cash incentives uh, for parents with higher education to have more children. That's something that's actually happened in a country called Singapore that I'm sure you've heard of. Um, they are, that's actually the world's only quote-unquote functioning authoritarian government, and they have had some quite peculiar borderline eugenics um, legislation in the past. It's all been overturned now, but there was a period where actually they got poor people, they gave poor people money if they got neutered. Do you know what neutering is? I mean, if it's not your first language, perhaps you don't know it, but I mean, you're all master students, you're all very intelligent, and I'm sure you have far more expansive vocabulary than I do in your respective languages, but just in case anyone isn't on the same page, neutering is literally, um, well, it prevents you from having children. Uh, you might have a, an animal neutered, uh, like a, a dog or a cat, um, so that you don't have to worry about a female cat getting pregnant, for instance, if you have it as a pet. It was extremely controversial to have it in humans, and Singapore got a lot of shit from the international, um, well, scene, um, uh, political climate, um, sorry, uh, political community for literally encouraging their people to get neutered. The scarier thing still is that it was effective by radically reducing the number of people with. Um, a low economic, uh, social and educational background uh, in, their, in their country, it meant that they were really rapidly able to shift their economy into the tertiary and quaternary industries, that is to say the service sector, that is heavily reliant on skilled labour. This in turn meant they were able to propel themselves into one of the most prominent uh, trading economies in Southeast Asia. Uh, they're essentially rivaled only by Hong Kong, who um, had, well, honestly, a fairly uh, unique uh, situation with the British. But I'm really going off on a tangent now. But the point is, is that eugenics is a bizarre and um, very touchy, very taboo almost subject, given that it's, it's, it's one of those that's acceptable to do to animals, but not acceptable to do to humans. Now, the reasons for that are very debatable, and I think, I don't necessarily side with the eugenics, but I definitely think it's a topic that shouldn't be avoided. It's one that politicians hate talking about, but one that actually does bear some statistical effects. There are some genes that, for some aspects of our society, are superior to others. However, you can look at the, it's, it's a very difficult thing to look at, because you can't say some people are better than others, that's just wrong. It's some traits in animals such as humans are uh, more uh, useful for surviving in our current society than others. People with uh, attention deficiency disorder, for instance, of which I myself have mild symptoms, um, are at a disadvantage in this world because uh, A, everything is constantly trying to grab your attention, so when you're trying to do work you get distracted by everything because there's your phone and so on, and advertisements absolutely thrive off of this. Um, and B, um, obviously compared to people who don't get distracted, you won't be able to get as much work done in the same period of time, therefore you are at a minor disadvantage in just about every work or academic related thing. Now I make it, I'm exaggerating it obviously for effect, but when you add up this and many of the other traits, such as um, thing, another controversial topic, something like beauty for instance, which is equally um, a matter for... Um, great debate does beauty even exist is it purely something that it's a matter of individual opinion um but it, it's a measured uh fact that people who are considered quote-unquote beautiful tend to be more successful in, in life there's a number of reasons for this uh mostly it's to do with confidence if you're pretty people will react to you differently and especially when you're growing up it is a massive confidence booster to have compliments or to have people treat you nicely or slightly more nicely than people others around you um, purely because you're prettier and this enables you to do better in uh, job interviews and so on and so forth and I'm not just making this shit up I if I can be bothered I'll link the papers that I've read when I was uh, doing my undergrad if I can't be bothered I'll just say man use Google Scholar you'll find a bunch of hits immediately and you can pick and choose from um, whichever academic journal uh, strikes your fancy um, but anyway, the point is, is that eugenics, it's, it has some practical bearing 
It's just that ethically it's so incredibly touchy as a subject that nobody wants to go anywhere near it. And there is very good reason for that. Historically, I don't need to mention what, but you know what I'm talking about. Historically, it has been explored by certain regimes and it was done in such a horrific and dystopian manner that now everyone wants to avoid it entirely. Nevertheless, in the future, as we have a larger and larger population and we're trying to use our scarce resources more and more efficiently, is it not something that to be considered to try and at least provide incentives for humans to encourage certain attributes that enable them to utilize the world around them more effectively? Traits like perhaps slightly higher intelligence or perception and so on could be very valuable in the long run, even if it's socially very taboo in the short term. So that's something to think about. I think I just went on a 10 minute tangent. Do apologize if you're bored. Obviously, I'm sure you would have stopped listening if you were bored. If you're still here, I thank you for listening to me and my uh, nonsensical ramblings. I hope that you got at least a little bit out of it. And without further ado, I'm going to finish the last couple of paragraphs of this chapter. Galton explained this averaging phenomenon in his celebra celebrated 1886 paper, Regression Towards Mediocrity in a Hereditary Stature. To today, we call this property regression to the mean. Um, again, it's one of those interesting things. Because we don't want to offend anyone these days, we call it regression to the mean. Because regression towards mediocrity offends anyone who's normal or average or whatever you want to call it. Regression to the mean is not a causal relationship. Rather, it's a statistical property of correlated pairs of variables, like the heights of fathers and sons. Although fathers' and sons' heights are never exactly the same, their frequency distributions are essentially unchanging. This distributional stability generates the Galton regression. We see regression as a statistical procedure with the power to make comparisons more equal through the inclusion of control variables in models for treatment effects. Galton seems to have been uninterested in regression as a control strategy. The use of regression for statistical control was pioneered by George Udney Ewell, a student of statistician Carl Pearson, who was Galton's protege. Uh, Ewell realized that Galton's regression method could be extended to include many variables. In an 1899 paper, Ewell used this extension to link the administration of the English poor laws in different counties to the likelihood county residents were poor, while controlling for population growth and the age distribution in the county. The poor laws provided subsistence for the indigent, usually by offering shelter and employment in institutions called workhouses. Ewell was particularly interested in whether the practice of outdoor relief, which provided some income support for poor people without requiring them to move into a workhouse, increased poverty rates by making pauperism less onerous. This is a well-defined causal question, much like those that occupy social scientists today. That, ladies and gentlemen, was chapter two, done in uh, a relatively uh, straightforward manner, I hope. Uh, I will leave out the appendix because I believe the majority of you will not wish to read that. I will also, if you've listened all the way to the end and you actually understand how uh, these equations work, I would very much appreciate if somebody could take a little bit of time to try and explain them to me at some point. So, uh, I mean, just hit me up on Facebook or WhatsApp or whatever, or just speak to me in person. I do like speaking to people in person. That's nice. But anyway, uh, the point is, is that even though I did economics, I never understood it because I'm a dumbass. So um, if anyone would mind uh, taking a tiny bit of time to explain how exactly regressions work, I get the gist of them. I just need a little bit of... Uh, help getting a bit more familiar with the individual uh, variables um, or whatever letters represent them and so on. Um, so yeah, if anyone could help me with that relationship uh, between the different letters, that would be very much appreciated. And once again, thank you for listening. I hope this was useful for you and I'll see you in the next one.